Hello everybody, I'm Logan Crawford and this is the award-winning TV talk show right here on Ebru Fresh Outlook, the Confederate flag, also known as the rebel flag in the south of the United States, is a casualty of the Charleston massacre. The governor of South Carolina calls on lawmakers to remove it from the statehouse grounds and retailers across the United States have stopped selling merchandise with the flag on it, a flag that for some it is a symbol of racism. Others view it as a historical artifact. Take a look. It began with the shooting of nine black church members in South Carolina. Photos of the gunmen showed an allegiance to the Civil War era symbol of pro-slavery Confederacy. That in turn began a renewed and passionate debate over the flying of the Confederate flag over the South Carolina State House. Several days into the debate, Alabama Governor Robert Bentley ordered the removal of Confederate flags from state properties. If, if there are flags that are actually flying over the grounds, if I have the authority to remove them, then I'm going to. The debate has forked into two arguments. First, a symbol of Southern pride versus the banner of oppression. Secondly, and perhaps more vocal, follows the actions of several large retailers who have pulled Confederate merchandise from the shelves. Is this, in fact, a step towards squelching free expression? Is it for a store to decide what can and cannot be made available? Or is it for the marketplace to decide what it will and will not support? What is certain is just as it was during the Civil War, the Stars and Bars banner has created divisiveness in the country. In today's age of political correctness, how far should the ban go and what could be the backlash? We are back live on set now here at Fresh Outlook. I am joined by the Fresh Outlook think tank. Yuhura Williams, Vice President of Academic Affairs at Fairfield University. Joining us live via our DC connection is Robert Chase, History Professor at Stony Brook University. I'm also joined today by Professor F. Michael Higginbotham, an internationally renowned expert on race and the author of the book, Ghosts of Jim Crow. Also joined today by Matthew Tiermond, a telecommunications expert, and he works on a website called openthebooks.com. Let's start out by talking about the flag. Michael, I've lived down south. The Civil War is still being fought on many levels. Um, and a lot of people wanted to preserve the flag. I happen to agree that it should be taken down because it is so offensive to so many people. What are your thoughts on it? Well, I agree with you, it should be taken down. I agree with the president, it belongs in a, in a museum. But I do see how some people could see different symbols. Uh, certainly there are those who say it's nostalgia, there are those who say it honors their ancestors, but I think the history is real clear. Uh, it was a flag that was created by an army to defend slavery. It was, uh, it was revived by a, a, a movement to defend Jim Crow segregation, and most recently, you know, it was flouted by an individual who walked into a church and killed nine people. So I think that it is divisive for most Americans. Uh, it symbolizes racial oppression and racial division. I think Governor Haley was correct in the sense of saying that it may be part of our past, but it's not going to be part of our future. And so I think it was a good week uh, in that sense. Turn to Matthew, what is your take? Uh, well, I personally believe that all symbols, just like speech, should not be banned. I do, however, concede that on a public building with the historical implications and the offense that it creates to so many in a plural and free society, the people have a right to stand up and say, you know, we do not want this to represent us. So I am not averse to Nikki Haley's decision. What worries me is the precedent it sets through public, uh, public demand for such a thing that it can then flow over into the private sector, which is what we're seeing. And so there's now a politically motivated push. Uh, and if businesses on their own volition want to remove it from their commercial activity, I 100% support that. But to have a political uh, push and motivation to do so worries me. You hurl what I worry about is that people are going to look at the Charleston massacre and say, see, we did something about this. We took down that damn flag. This isn't about the flag. It's about so much more, right? Well, it's ultimately about human life. It's about the gun lobby in this country, the easy access to guns, to firearms. It's about racial division. And quite frankly, symbolic gestures tend to have symbolic consequences, not substantive consequences. We need to have a real serious discussion in this country about not only gun violence, but our problem with racial uh, inequality. Uh, and all of its manifestations. And the problem with a situation like this is that it becomes a celebratory moment if the flag comes
comes down, but a missed opportunity if we don't have any deeper conversation, deeper discussion, and some real political action on those areas that, quite frankly, continue to prove divisive, race being chief among them. And let's turn to Robert now. Robert, another fear I have is the nuts out there like this madman, I don't even like to say his name, who opened fire on nine people in the church, will actually, actually wrap themselves tighter in that rebel flag now, saying, see, they're trying to take away our flag. They've won a battle here. What's your take? Well, precisely, I worked in, in Charleston at the Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture for two years, and I knew uh, two of the victims of this assault. And in fact, we had a conference there on black power where we invited Yohuru Williams as our distinguished speaker. I would say this about Dylan Roof, and I think we should name him and name his kind of violence. It has a history. Uh, the assault on black churches is associated with a longer assault on churches as a space not only of black spirituality, but civil rights and social justice. During the 1960s, over 300 black churches were bombed, burned, including the 16th Street Church in Birmingham, then known as Bombingham, where four girls died in a nightmare moment three weeks after Martin Luther King delivered his I Have a Dream speech. And indeed, in 1964, during Freedom Summer, a black church was burned every other week. So we need to understand this symbol of the Confederate flag in this history of violence and, importantly, as a state response to the civil rights movement, as in 1962, the governor of South Carolina, Fritz Hollings, put that flag for the centennial of the Civil War. Here we sit at the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, and it was done not just to remember the Civil War, but as part of massive resistance against the civil rights movement and questions of social justice and a state response to it. So we need to understand that, and when individuals take this as terrorists, they're tapping into a longer history. And while Dylan Roof didn't understand that history completely, he certainly was inspired by our history of racial violence against civil rights and social justice movements, and the Black Lives Matter movement and Trayvon Martin inspired his act. Okay, we're going to talk more about the massacre in Charleston in our next segment. Right now, we're going to focus a little bit more on the flag. And Michael, being a TV news reporter in the mid-1990s in Atlanta, Georgia, went up to Stone Mountain, Georgia. I don't know if you've ever been there. And I was shocked. All these pickup trucks with young guys flying the rebel flag, and I believe the fathers of the Confederacy carved into the side of the mountain. Why is it that this abhorrent part of American history is so alive and well and celebrated by mostly white people in the South. Well, I tell you, as I talk about in, in my book, Ghosts of Jim Crow, there's a long history of having a racial model in this country that, that involves racial division, racial hierarchy, and racial victimization. And I think the embrace of the Confederate flag, as well as many other things that are going on today, like disrespect to the first African American president when you stand up in, in Congress and say you lie, which is unprecedented for a congressman to do to the president when he's giving a, a State of the Union address. These kinds of examples, I think, reflect that racial model that continues. It, it, while we've made progress in terms of eliminating Jim Crow segregation, in terms of passing anti-discrimination laws, while we've made progress, progress doesn't mean post-racial. Progress doesn't mean that race is no longer significant in our society. And I think the embrace of the Confederate flag, as well as these other things that are going on, uh, you know, in terms of the criminal justice system in terms of the number of deaths of young African-American males, as well as segregation in our schools and, and discrimination in housing and so forth. I think those continue to embrace that model, which we have made progress on, but we haven't destroyed. And that's what we need to do. Matthew, let's turn to the free speech issue here a little bit. Um, this Confederate flag has been compared to the Nazi swastika. And uh, someone else actually went a bit further. Instead of just banning the Confederate flag, he said he'd like to see the American flag torn down. You might know I'm talking about Absolutely. Louis Farrakhan. Um, tell me about this racial divide that, in my view, seems to have uh, become greater 
since President Obama became president? Is it the reactionaries holding on to the past? Why do you think racial tensions have flared under the tenure of President Obama, if you accept that presence, uh, premise? Uh, well, first, I do want to discuss what was alluded to on this idea of co-opting symbols. The swastika was co-opted by the Nazis and was used as one of the great symbols of hate and violence and obviously genocidal uh, messianic activity. Uh, but previous to Nazi Germany, it was not a symbol in this way. It had alternative, more positive implications throughout history. And it tells you that symbols can be co-opted. But we know what that symbol means now. Yes. But that's and, a thing. But, it and, was co -opted, and, and right. now this move to ban it in different parts of the world, I think, is does more damage to fighting these battles that we're trying to fight as pluralistic societies. If you look in Europe where it is illegal to have not neo-Nazi, pro-Nazi, and swastika-laden imagery, the movements underground are more vociferous than they would be if you brought them out into the open. And that's what I'm worrying is going to happen And that's what I here. talked about before, that people actually wrap themselves in the flag. And Euro, I want to talk to you a little bit about this. And uh, I think we're, we're catching the yeah. drift on that. If you ban something, it actually makes it more enticing. Particularly but there's the a conflation. Nuts. You conflated the same issue that the professor did on this issue of Obama becoming this symbol of race in America as well because of the hostility to him as America's first black president. I spent a lot of time around the country in all sorts of uh, parts of the political divide. And the issues in parts of America that are being held up as racial issues, they're not racial issues with opposition to Obama. They're issues to policy. I know Congressman Joe Wilson, who stood up and said, you lie. He's one of the least racist people I've ever met. He's a really, really good guy. The unprecedented factor that drove him to make that statement was the unprecedented lying by the President of the United States. I, I find that difficult to uh, swallow. <clears throat> I had a piece come out in the LA Progressive this week uh, called Raising a White Flag, where microaggressions become macro confessions. And what we see in instances like that really are moments where, as African Americans, people of color, look at this and say, what are you really saying? Charles Cotton of the um, NRA, for example, talked about if these parishioners have been armed and, and basically blamed uh, the pastor Pinckney for not arming his parishioners for the violence that took place in that church. That's problematic. I agree in the sense that when we see episodes like this, we don't want to automatically go and say, well, something's racist. At the same time, people of color look at this and say, these are examples of micro microaggressions that we've been dealing with for years and trying to call out. And in these moments, it's pretty clear, South Carolina is another moment, that when you privilege the, South, uh, when you privilege the Confederate flag over the nine lives of nine citizens, there's a problem. When you lower the American flag, but the Confederate flag stays raised, what are you ultimately saying about citizenship? What are you ultimately saying about civil rights and where we are as a society and a, culture, and a country? That's the real problem. I agree with that. As we talk about symbols, let me turn to Robert for just a second. We're talking about symbolisms and what they mean. Let's talk about a very power, powerful symbol, a word. President Obama said the N-word in reacting to the Charleston massacre. Now, I can't say that word. White politicians can't say that word. Are you creating a two-tier system where some people are privileged and can say that word with a hard R or an A, and other people are forbidden to say it because they'd be perceived as a bigot? I think what's important to understand with President Obama's use of that word is the context in which he was trying to place it, which was to say, one doesn't need to scream that word and use the n-word in that way but if he had said the n-word we would have known what he was talking we have about a country that has two point well but what he's saying is is that there's a deeper structural problem of race in america which quite eloquently during his eulogy at reverend pickney's um or during the eulogy at reverend pickney in charleston he spoke to this issue what are those issues mass incarceration economic inequality, uh, questions of policing, um, questions of health care, all of those things that are on the one hand celebrating a black African-American president and on the other uh, miring African-American youth in a system of inequality. So we don't need to just use this word in order to have a society that still suffers from its history of racism, racist ideology, and racist symbols. And indeed, an experience that structures African-Americans as unequal, even though we do have a Civil Rights Act, we also are retreating, for instance, on the Voting Rights Act 
through the justice uh, through the Supreme Court's decision under uh, Chief Justice Roberts. Okay, we've got a whole lot more to talk about this. In fact, Robert just opened up a can of worms. Since I need ID to take out a library book, I should need ID to vote, right? That's how I feel about it. We'll find out what our panel thinks about it. More on the massacre on the, at the Charleston Church as well after this.